I love what our creative people do with this stuff, man. It just gets me all pumped up. And I gotta tell you, in that last song, I just, I, I, I'm so thankful to be lost in a moment of truth. Those words that we sing are not just lyrics to a song. They are the truth of why you were created, what God has done. And I don't know if, if, if you don't feel the permission to get lost in a moment with those truths. I want to give you that permission because you were created to worship the God who created you. And when you sing those words from your soul, your heart is connecting with your mind and something significant happens. So just let me be pastoral before we jump in. Listen, when we sing those songs, they're not just to entertain you. They're for you to engage with and participate in. So I, I, for those of you that were there and, and lost in that and, and, and breathing that in, awesome. But for you that didn't, I want to encourage you next time, when we get up to sing the last song, let your heart cry out those truths and see what God does with that. So having said all that, let me just say, hey, my name is Shaq, but you know I'm the pastor here at, at Pursuit Church. If you didn't get that, that's who I am. I'm so thankful to be here at Pursuit. I'm so grateful for how God works and redeems and is building his church. Is anybody else thankful for that today? Woo! God is building his church, and we witnessed that last week as we saw four individuals say and go public with their faith in Jesus Christ. And man, I'm, I'm still living on that this week. It's so awesome that God is at work. You guys need to know that. Yes, COVID's going on. Yes, we're still kind of locked down and wearing masks everywhere. But my friends, God is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And there is your proof from last week. So don't want to miss that and celebrate that. Thank you, John, for reminding us of that this morning that we saw God working in front of our very eyes last week. Guys, I've been so excited about this study of Daniel. God has stirred my soul so deeply. And I'm, we're just going to stay in it for a couple extra weeks. Is that okay? Because there's just more to get out of it. God wants to speak more. And so we're going to jump into Daniel chapter 10. You can turn there in your Bibles. We'll get there in a minute. But let me just get some of my preamble out of the way. I want to welcome you if you're a guest with us today. I'm not get that out of the way. That's an important thing. If you're a guest, thank you for coming today. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we believe that this is a place where you can belong before you believe. Would you turn to your neighbor real quickly and say, you can belong before you believe. In other words, you have a place to be. You have a people who care about you and you do not have to walk alone in this life. That is the design that God has given mankind from the very beginning when he said it is not good for man to be alone. Let me also just quickly say, those of you watching online, we're glad that you're joining with us. Take a minute, let us know where you're watching from so we can say hi to you and encourage you and be praying for you as well. We know that many people are watching online, but we've got room here in this big gym. We'd love to see you, meet you in person real soon. Okay, you guys, uh, saddle up, buckle up. Here we go. We're in in game. This series has been about the end of all things, right? We're looking at the story of Daniel. Daniel lived in a time and in an era where he was under foreign governance. In other words, the people that he was working for and living for or producing for were godless. They did not worship the God of his nation, the nation of Israel, the God of Isaac, Jacob, and who else? Isaac, Jacob, and who? Abraham, thank you. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, thank you. We're all in this together this morning. But here in Daniel, we see God's answer to the problem of evil and how that problem is going to be solved. And we've been learning how we as people maintain hope and a way of life that says Jesus is the king of kings. My friends, that is the truth of this world and this life. Jesus is king. As we begin this morning, let me get our, our minds thinking about the topic. So let me ask you this. Have you faced a battle in this last week? If you faced a battle of any sort, would you just put your hand up? All right, we're a good company. I don't think anybody was left not raising their hand. And maybe you even fought a battle to be here this morning. My friends, battles have been a part of the human experience since time began. Not only do we engage in them ourselves, literally, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, but we tell stories about them. 
We see them all throughout history. Let me see if you recognize some of these scenes, some of the famous stories that we've told recently. Do you recognize this scene right here from Braveheart? What a great battle scene. Freedom! You know, he was fighting for the freedom of his people, right? He's fighting a battle that was valued and worthwhile. What about this scene? We even tell science fiction battle scenes. Anybody know this scene? Anybody know this from? We titled the series Endgame. So yes, we have to, to pay homage to Endgame. This is a fight between Thanos and one of the Avengers. We tell the stories about it. They intrigue us. Unfortunately, there are real wars that we have seen and tragedies that have unfolded. This next image is the image from a colonial war where great tragedy and death occurred. Many lives were taken as men stood up in front of one another and fired rifles hoping they wouldn't be shot. They considered that honorable and courageous. We have our own civil war here in the United States of America, right? Fighting for the freedom of people, for all people to have freedom. A noble, worthy cause, but how much human tragedy and life was lost in that battle. Fast forward into our generation. Things that we have seen, Desert Storm, this famous scene after the battle was, was won pretty easily and handily. They set fire to all oil fields. Some battles people think are the extremes of the human experience, but my friends, when sin entered the human experience in the fall of mankind, paradise was lost, and our battle to be human as God designed began. From that very day, we battled sin and suffering as a result of our rebellion against God's design. The battle is real. That rebellion against God and His design has, has told uncountable, innumerable, innumerable amount of stories of human tragedy. Sin and suffering and evil, my evil are here, my friends, until Jesus returns and removes evil eternally. And the good news is that day is coming. That day is coming. But until then, we battle. We fight battles of every kind as a result of sin. Soon spring will arrive. How many of you know what battle's coming up this spring? It's a famous battle that most people fight. If you own a yard, if you have a yard around your house or you do a garden, do you know what it is? The battle of the weeds is coming, right? They pop up everywhere. We, we do everything to eliminate them, right? We fight a battle front on just about every place we look. It, the most difficult one is we fight our own battle of sin and selfishness. We like having control of our lives. We like to, to, to have a say in where we go and what we do, when we do it, how long we do it for, and when we fight, we fight when those things are taken away from us, right? That's the battle that we've watched unfold and we've even fought ourselves over the last year. So we know battles are part of our experience in life, but Here's my question this morning. Are we fighting the right battle? Do we know who our real enemy is in this life, or do we get duped into a battle that is not ours to fight? Again, this series has been so important because if we get caught up in the events of the day and we lose sight of an eternal perspective, we lose hope. This series has been about hope, where we find true hope, lasting hope, that is not going to change because our God is eternal and His character does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and will be forever. And you have to know that God has written the rest of the story, and it's good. Everything sad is coming untrue. That is God's story that he's writing. Everything sad is coming untrue. So the main idea today for the message is this. When the battle rages, God's people respond with fervent prayer. Let's do that right now. Let's pray. Father God, as we sang that song, our battle is on our knees. With our hands lifted up. 
and surrender to you, the creator of this universe, to the God who made us and made this world. Forgive us, Father, as a nation and as a people, for we have been rebellious against you. We have served our own purposes, and we have rejected your great love for us. God, there is no justification for that kind of pride and rebellion against your beauty, against your creation, and against your love. Father, forgive us. Forgive this nation for the slaughter of the innocent blood. We have done wrong against you. We pray now for our leaders. We pray now, God, for our community. We pray for the families that are struggling in the middle of this pandemic, whatever it is, God. We pray for the marriages that are hanging on by a thread and the relationships that are at their breaking points, God. We pray for the parents and the children who are struggling to understand to live in a, a strange place, in a strange way. Oh God, we need you. We need your grace, your mercy, your wisdom. Father, we pray that you would grant that to us today as we search in your word and we try to understand what battle you've called us to fight and where you've called us to lay down our arms and surrender. We want to be your people. We want to live in your design. We ask your grace to do so this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel chapter 10. You can get there at pursuitchurch.com notes. Dot com slash notes. You can go to version Bible app, Daniel chapter 10, or Bible Minutes. Get there and follow along with the notes of what we'll be doing. If you would stand with me as we read Daniel chapter 10, verses 1 through 13 this morning, we stand to honor the reading of God's word, God's love letter to mankind, and is worthy of our honor and respect. Daniel 10, Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. Oh, these, these dreams and visions are so much fun! <laughs> this, is, this is so fun. This stuff is amazing. Uh, God is, knows how to grab our attention. I love that in his word. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true and it concerned a great war. The understanding of this message came to him in a vision. Take note of that. It was true and it concerned a great war. Verse 2, at that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, river the Tigris, I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen, with a belt of fine gold from Ephaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. Now just picture that for a minute. That's pretty freaky, pretty weird. But this is what he's seeing. So I imagine he's paying close attention, right? Verse 7, I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see it. But such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. They had no idea what was going on, but they were scared to death. And they got out of there, left Daniel standing there going, Hey! Uh. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then... I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, and my face to the ground. So now he's on the ground, face down, and a hand touched me, and, I, and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you, and stand up, for I now have been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel. 
Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I've come in response. Verse 13, pay special attention to this. We're going to dial in on this verse today. But the prince of Persia, or the Persian kingdom, resisted me 21 days. Who's the prince of the Persian kingdom? Good question. I'm glad you asked. I'll answer that in just a minute. He resisted me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, who was that, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Again, the main idea is this, my friends. When the battle rages, God's people respond in fervent prayer. When a battle rages around you, your response as a believer in Jesus Christ is to go to your knees in prayer. In Daniel chapter 10, we really come to the close of the book of Daniel because chapters 10 through 12 encompass the last vision that was given to Daniel. And with it, we see the conclusion of Daniel's ministry. So that's where we are in the context of the whole book. Verse 14 of chapter 10, that very next verse that we didn't read. Now I've come to explain to you, this is the, the uh, messenger from God, what will happen to your people in the future. For the vision concerns a time yet to come. So we're, there's a prophetic element that we're going to get into that Daniel was given that is relevant even to us today. But let me say this, this morning's message is not about prophecy. It's about something very critical, but it's not about the prophecy. But it's important for us to set the stage to give us an understanding of what's taking place in these last couple of chapters. So in verse 1, let's go back to verse 1. It says there, in the third year of, king of, the, of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel. It was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned what? A great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. So again, some of the context, historically, these events begin in chapter 10, are after the events in chapter 9, which we studied last week. You can get online and watch the message from last week, and all the messages on Daniel as well are on there. At this point, Daniel is an old man, he's most likely in his 80s. He's lived and seen a lot by this time. He's lived through the time of the Babylonian Empire and is now living in the time of the Medo-Persian Empire. And he knows what's coming next. He knows there's another great war coming. The Greek Empire is about to come on the stage and he knows that things are not going to end there. In fact, he's given a vision. God is allowing him to see all the way to the very end of the human history, to the millennial reign of Christ, when a time of peace under theocracy will soon or will be coming. But according to verse 1, Daniel had this vision in the third year of King Cyrus, and, and that's important to remember and understand because two years prior to those events, about 50,000 individuals that were from the nation of Israel got to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple and their city. And you can read about that in the book of Ezra. But we find out there as well in Ezra that once the Jews reached Jerusalem, they faced opposition. Opposition to rebuilding the temple, and it stopped. And the words left from that, from uh, the nation of Israel, those who went back, have reached Daniel. And that's most likely the reason for his current emotional state. We read about that in verse 2. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. My friends, have you ever mourned something in your life? I know there was a period for about a year that I mourned one of the, the deepest, most significant losses that I'd ever had in my life. And it seemed like every Wednesday night when we gathered for prayer with some other believers, I was just weeping. <laughs> just weeping at the devastating loss. And my heart was, was, was low. <laughs> discouraged because of this significant loss in my life. And I relate to Dan understanding that he was mourning for three weeks because of a loss. He saw that these promises of God were being thwarted. There was a battle going on. And that led Daniel to do what Daniel always did. He prayed. 
And that is the time, the context in which Daniel receives this vision. He is made aware of a battle. And now with all that background, I want to come back to the focus in on one verse, verse 13. Notice there, very important, the prince of, per of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now remember who the prince of Persia is. Do we know who that is? No, we haven't been told who that is, do you have we? But we do know that God had sent a messenger in the spiritual realm, in the supernatural realm, to give Daniel this vision. And it wasn't a physical being that held Daniel up. It was a spiritual being, a fallen angel who had been given authority over Persia. And he was resisting or holding back the messenger who was sent to deliver this message to Daniel. And here we find Daniel's being made, made aware of the spiritual battle that is being waged between the forces of God and the forces of wickedness. There are four really important observations or truths that we need to consider around this. Number one, in your notes, there is a battle raging right now. We're going to go to the New Testament for some insight on that. Ephesians chapter 6 says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God that's, so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. Notice this next verse. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so when the deep day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and, you have done, and when you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might declare it fearlessly as I should. My friends, there is a spiritual battle and a spiritual reality going on around us. We live in a world system that is not redeemed. It is energized by the, the enemy of our souls. Be aware. Daniel was told here, Daniel, that there was a prince of Persia that was actively opposing the messenger of God sent to Daniel. And then Michael, the archangel of God, had to assist the heavenly messenger in his journey to Daniel. My friends, don't let that pass you by or you'll be fooled into fighting a battle you were never intended to fight in this life. But know this, there's a battle going on right now all around us. My friends, if there is a wicked prince of Persia, you can be sure there is a wicked prince of Fort Collins, of Larimer County, a wicked prince of the United States of America, who is opposed to God's people and God's work. And for a time, God has allowed this battle to go on. And just briefly, I will say, the wisdom behind that is so that in eternity, when we look back, we know what it looks like in a world without God. And the evil and the suffering that is produced when mankind rebels against God's wisdom. The depth of pain and suffering that we see is going to be equal and multiplied countless times over in eternity when we look back and see the beauty of God's redemptive plan. But until then, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. My friends, when you put a face with a frustration, you're being duped by the enemy. 
When you ostracize people on the other side of the aisle and you see them as the enemy, you're being duped. They are not the enemy. They may be taken captive by the enemy, but they are not the enemy. God calls us to pray, to intercede, to be fervent. But don't be duped into fighting battle that is not ours to fight. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. People who are redeemed by Jesus, when opposition and war ensues, we respond in fervent prayer because we know God is the one who fights our battles. And if he calls us to give up our lives, we give up our lives because he's worthy of it. He's worth it. This world is going away. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Let's be people of the light. People who love fiercely like he loved us. Who run after the prodigals. Run to them. Bring them into God's family. That's how God's people respond. The second thing we need to know and understand is we are too often unaware or willfully unaware of the battle. Daniel, we see your struggle for three weeks, most likely not fully aware of the real battle that was taking place just beyond his eyesight because we're human. We, we touch, we feel, we see. We're consumed by the physical things of this world. And that's not a bad thing, but we, we lose sight of eternity and the spiritual and the supernatural when we are consumed with our flesh. But we see here Daniel wasn't aware until the angel told him. There's a very real battle, my friends. We are so caught up in the affairs of this world, our hunger, physically, mentally, emotionally, we miss it. God opened the eyes of, of a servant one time, who was Elijah's servant. There was a battle ensuing. The enraged king of Aram in 2 Kings, we see this. He summoned his offers to man that tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel. None of us, my lord, the king said, one of the officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He is in Dothan, so they sent horses and chariots and a strong force to capture him. They went by night, surrounded the city. When the servant man got up and went out early the next morning, an army of horses and chariots had surrounded the city. His servant says, oh, ah, oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? Here's the prophet. Do not be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hill full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Elisha, Elisha's servant was so focused on the physical battle, he failed to see the spiritual battle. But by God's grace, his eyes were open. My prayer for us today is that our eyes would be open. My friends, we're not fighting a physical battle. There is a spiritual battle. The enemy loves to use this tactic to make you think he's not there. He's not doing anything. He's not really there. No. It's just stupid people. Fools. How can they believe in that? Those stupid people. Yeah. They're stupid because they're taken captive by the enemy. Our hearts should break for that. Not judge that. If he can keep us focused on something other than the spiritual battle, then that would be just fine with him. My friends, the real battle is destroying our children and destroying our marriages, destroying our homes. It's destroying our churches and it's destroying our nation. It is not a physical battle. The church must awaken in prayer. The ultimate war is between God's truth and the enemy's lies. My friends, it is not left or right. Don't be duped. God is not redeeming government. God is redeeming people. He is redeeming marriages. He is redeeming prodigals. I don't care who 
who's in charge. I want to be on God's side. I hope you do too. The war is between God's truth and the enemy's lies. Daniel reminds us of that fact. In verse 1, the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, revelation was given to Daniel, called Belteshazzar. He said his message was true and it concerned a great war. The understanding of this message came to him in a vision. We know there is truth in Jesus, and Jesus is truth. If you are searching for truth, you need to gaze upon the person of Jesus Christ. Look what he says of himself. You judge. I am simply a messenger of Jesus' message. This is what he says. You make the decision for yourself. He says, I am the way, Jesus words himself, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yes, Jesus Christ is exclusively the Savior of this world. There is no other name under heaven by where you will be saved. Jesus is the truth. And he came to earth to reveal the truth of life to us and to introduce us to the very nature of truth in God. If you are not walking with Jesus, you're living a lie. You're living in deception. You're sucked into the world, and you do not have hope. And that is the truth, and I will not shy away from teaching and preaching it. If you want truth, you find it in the person of Jesus, revealed in the Bible. 1 John 5, 20 says this, We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true by being in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. My friends, you live a blip of life, 60, 70, 80 years. And then there's all of eternity. What are you doing with the blip or the dash that you're living? Because if you're not living in Christ, you're living in a lie. You're living in a fairy tale, in a fantasy. In opposition to the truth of God through His Son Jesus Christ is the enemy of humanity. The enemy of God is Satan, fallen angel, the father of lies. And Jesus is recorded as speaking to religious leaders of the day. Religious leaders of the day. Religious leaders of the day. Listen to who he's talking to here. And he says this. They were telling the people all how they should live and all the things that they should do. And Jesus is saying, come to me, you weary, and I will give you rest. But here's what he says to them. And to anybody that, that pushes religion on you, you belong to the Father your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. My friends, the difference in the battle we're fighting is for God's truth and the, against the enemy's lies. Not against... <laughs> I'm not going to go there. I went there once already. This is where the battle is. Please see that, my friends. Get off the bandwagons. Get out of that environment. It's unhealthy. And be strong in the Lord. The fourth thing you need to see there, Daniel's encouraged to the same, same thing here. And I'm extending a little bit longer. I want to give you the application here. Stay with me, guys. We're going to come to this finish line. Uh, quickly, I want to get you some application points of what we're talking about, but be strong in the Lord. Daniel was encouraged by that. Do not be afraid. You are highly esteemed. Peace. Be strong now. Be strong. And when he spoke to me, I was strengthened. I said, speak, my Lord, since you've given me strength. We are encouraged in the same way by Paul, who wrote a letter to a young new church. He says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. You fight spiritual battles by spiritual means, not by fleshly means. Please feel free to send me any emails asking questions for clarification. What am I even saying? What Am I saying, so what to the second amendment? Email me if you have questions. I'll talk to you about it. It's time for today. So how should we live? 
Daniel gives us the example at that time. Daniel, he mourned for three weeks. He ate no choice food. No meat or wine touched his lips. He was fasting. He used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. What was Daniel doing here? He was fasting and praying. We learned from him. Again, in your notes, prayer is our weapon. Prayer is our weapon. Now let me be the first to say this. If somebody comes against my family, you will never see a more fierce warrior come out. I don't care whether it's my bare hands, oh my God, or whatever it may be that's close by. If somebody comes against my family in any way, shape, or form, they will meet the demise. I will, I will lay my life down to defend my family. Okay, don't misunderstand me. That's not God's. God's people respond with fervent prayer. So when we pr we pray, when we see opposition to God's kingdom, Daniel was grief stricken about the state of his homeland. He responded in prayer. We see that in verses 12 through 14. When there was resistance. He was in the midst of praying, and then finally that release, he broke through. As he persisted in fervent prayer, the messenger broke through because Michael was sent to come help him in the midst of that prayer. There's a very real and unseen battle being waged, my friends. We've got to be aware of that. Ephesians, again, the reminder, pray in the Spirit at all times, on every occasion, stay alert and be persistent. Prayer is the weapon, so we pray to see more of God's kingdom. The next application... Again, stay with me. We're going to move through these quickly. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and through 19. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Again, the more we continue in fervent prayer, the more we have the opportunity to see God's kingdom unfold in our lives. Jesus taught us to pray that way. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is how Jesus taught us to pray and to battle in the spiritual realm. Praying for God's kingdom to come. Prayer is a weapon, so we pray again for, for the power of the Holy Spirit. It is an offensive weapon that tears down enemy strongholds. If you combine prayer with the truth of God's word, you have a an absolutely unbeatable combination of offensive weapons. 2 Corinthians 10 tells us this. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Our heart is as for God's heart. And that is for people to be redeemed. The battle we fight is between God's truth and the enemy's lies. Again, Daniel is teaching us to fight the spiritual battle by spiritual means and not by our flesh. Lastly, we pray prayers are weapons so we pray for increased fruitfulness. My friends, it's easy to misunderstand or miss this crucial point. There's a foundational element here that God is at work in this world. He creates opportunities. We are to seek his leading in essence created through prayer. A line of communication so we can see what's really going on. Before we moved into this neighborhood, many of you remember, we did a prayer walk. We walked through this neighborhood. We just prayed, God, show us where you're at work. Show us where there is need. Show us how we can be a people who's in line with what you're doing. And he gave us things to do that we thought were really weird, like a, like a drive-through truck or treat. But by golly, God used that to reach a few people. And then at Christmas, we did a drive-through nativity because all this weird COVID stuff's going on. On. And by his grace, he allowed us to connect with a few more people. And, and, and so God opens up more fruitfulness as we pray and seek him. Strategy and good planning are important, but they flow out of spiritual activities. They don't replace them. And listen, here's the truth. We are surrounded by people who don't know Jesus in northern Colorado. In our prayer time this morning before the church service, we were reminded there's, there's about 300,000 some odd people in, in northern Colorado proximity in the Tri-City area. Excuse me. And there are only about 8% of those people, 92% roughly, have no connection to Jesus, let alone his church and his bride. Think about that for a minute. 
92% of people in northern Colorado have no connection to Jesus or his church. They're headed to a Christless eternity. Jesus says this in Matthew 9. He went through the towns and villages teaching, proclaiming the good news, healing disease and sickness. When he saw crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. My friends, God has sent somebody, sent somebody here today who's ready to answer the call of the harvest. A young man and his wife sitting over there ready to go to Loveland and say, Jesus is alive. Isn't that right? We're praying for that. God is doing that. God is at work. Pray for this couple. Today, because they're going into a godless place to say Jesus is alive. When we ask him, he sends. We're part of a group of, of churches that pray for God to go forward, and he answers those prayers. You get to see one of those answers today. So let me ask you this. Not only is God sending out people in that way, but he's sending you. We've talked about this before. Who is your one? If you would just commit to one person, praying for one person in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your family, who are you praying for in the season of renewal that God is using through COVID? Friends, God is doing something. He is awakening something in this world. And he wants you to be a part of it, to live on mission in the middle of the battle, to not sit back and give up. He's calling people to step out and go forth. And you can do that by just choosing to pray for one person. Just pray for them. That's all I'm asking of you. Pray for them. Pray that God will awaken them. Look at what Jesus says. And, and let that inspire your prayer. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. Pray the simple prayer for that one person. God, would you please draw them to your son, Jesus? The battle rages. When the battle rages, God's people respond with fervent prayer. We've got some bad news and good news as we close out here. The bad news is, is you are sinful and you are a sinner. You know how I know that? Because I've hung out with some of you. No, I know that because God said it's true. In Romans, I, I do know that too because of that. But I'm going to leave that. I'm not going to talk, talk about our sinfulness in here. But look around. Everybody just look around for a second. You are looking at a bunch of sinful sinner people. Sinful, selfish people. Well, go ahead and say that. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. Go ahead and say it. Go ahead and just take a minute. You're a sinner. Wait for them all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, I, 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 I don't do that to, to demean or diminish that at all. Please don't, don't misunderstand me. I do that because I, I want you to have a light and an open enough heart, and I know God works that out, to receive the truth here. The Bible says clearly in Romans 3, you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You have sinned, I have sinned. The consequence of that sin, the wages of sin in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's how you respond to that truth. Romans 10.9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Declare with your mouth, believe in your heart, you will be saved, because with your heart you believe and are justified, but with your mouth you profess your faith and are saved. Last week, beautiful celebration of four people going public with their faith, faith, professing their faith in Jesus Christ. That's not what saved them. It was their declaration and belief in their heart. Their baptism was just them saying publicly, I believe in Jesus and I want to declare that he is my Lord and Savior, and I want the world to know that. Even as they were doing that, I got a message from someone else who might want to be baptized, and so we're gonna to have to end up doing a baptism even sooner than we were planning before, which is awesome. 
But if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, would you all bow your head and close your eyes? If you've not done that, I want to give you the opportunity to pray and receive and trust Christ today. And I just want to give you some words. You can pray them where you are to God from your heart, declaring Him as your Lord and Savior. And just ask your permission to be your pastor and shepherd right now and, and leading you in this. If you are ready to give your life to Jesus, just pray this to Him right now. Jesus, I know I'm sinful. And I realize my good works will never outweigh my bad choices and my sinful choices. I believe you died for my sins. And I want to turn away from them right now. I need your forgiveness in my life. I trust you now to be my Lord and Savior. And with your help, I will follow you the rest of my life in the fellowship and the friendship of your church. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer today for the first time, if you just lift up your hand, let me know. I'd love to pray for you. Awesome. See you, my friend. Is there anybody else out there today? Ready to declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior. God, I thank you for this heart that surrendered to you today here in our midst. Bowing their knee to declare you as Lord and Savior. Choosing to follow you the rest of their life. God, I pray you would empower them with your Holy Spirit. Give them a hunger for your word, a hunger for truth, and a hunger to follow you for the rest of their life. God, I pray for wisdom. I pray for friends to surround this person and give them the strength to follow you. I pray that they would lean into the friendship and fellowship of your church for that. We praise you, Jesus, today. God, for those of us who are believers, would you remind us of the one person that you want to use us to reach and touch in this life. For this next year, we would be praying that you would draw them to your side. God, we thank you for your grace and mercy in our lives, for us sinful people who are redeemed and learning to walk more and more like your son Jesus every day. Give us the strength and the wisdom to do that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.